Uh, so fabrication. I want to talk about digital and physical. Um, there's a lot of attention, I'd say, overblown hype to connecting things to the internet. What I want to talk about is a much, much deeper connection between how digital meets physical. So one of these doesn't fit. Can you, can you tell which? Um, going further back in the 40s, Claude Shannon digitized communication. You think you know what that means. But what it really means is he proved the first threshold theorem. He showed if I communicate not by a waveform but by a symbol, for a linear increase in the size of the symbol, there's an exponential reduction in the error rate to decode it. And that exponential scaling took about 10 years of fighting in the phone system, uh, but that's why I have the internet. Bo Bob Lucky told me the battle was won because the analog managers died. <laughs> so it's, it's a lesson in organizational change. But, um, <laughs> That's why we use digital communication. Uh, John von Neumann digitized computation, and he did it with threshold theorems. Vannevar Bush made the last great analog computer at MIT, a room full of gears and pulleys, and it got worse with time. Uh, von Neumann showed if you compute with a symbol, uh, there's an exponential reduction in error for a linear increase in the state. There's very, very few exponentials in engineering. That's why we're digital. Um, MIT made the first NC-MIL in 1952. It was an offshoot of a, a, one of the first real-time computers, the Whirlwind in Project Sage in Norbert Wiener's Servo Mechanism Lab. Now, fast forward to today um, with overhyped uh, additive manufacturing and 20 other descendants of computers controlling machines to make stuff. Uh, the state is continuous. All the wonderful machines, cutting, squirting, burning, bending, the state's in the computer. There's no information in the materials. Um, a child playing with Lego, the state is discrete, which means the child can make something bigger than themselves. Metrology is local. Um, uh, you can detect and correct errors. When you 3D print errors accumulate, uh, the tower is more accurate than the child. Um, you can join dissimilar materials, and when you're done, you don't put Lego in the trash, you disassemble it, you reuse it. Those are exactly the properties Shannon and von Neumann taught us. They don't apply to any of the advanced manufacturing today because the information is still in the computer. So what I want to talk about is digitizing not the design in the computer, but the information within the materials. My prior art, the prior art, I really like is four billion years ago, and that's when the ribosome evolved. The ribosome builds me and you as molecular machinery coding construction with exactly the properties I showed on the last slide and exactly the things Shannon and Van Neumann taught us. So a year ago, I was so irritated by government agencies asking me about their 3D printing projects. I ran a program with the White House OSTP and all the agencies to talk about digitizing not information in the computer that dates back to the 50s, but actually digitizing the materials. Um, coming out of that, there's a research roadmap from computers controlling machines to machines making machines to then putting codes and programs and materials. So what I want to run through now is what those steps look like and then some of the surprising implications. So uh, one step in, we've been looking at rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping machines, making machines that are as easy to make as projects on the machine. And so to do that, um, let's see, yesterday, Nadia Peek and James Coleman is here, um, showed a number of these machines. This is a, a, a flexible fab tool, oh, let's see. Um, you've lost my video? Um, uh, um, see, do you, I, I'm putting out video? There. Um, uh, we'll skip that video. Um, but the idea of the machines that make machines is um, CAD, CAM, machine control, motion control, structural systems are historically done by different people at different places at different times. And there's a very bad party game where you pass things through each of the steps. And so we found we had to implement all of them for ourselves. So in a straight path, you can go direct from the data structure out to the machine. And James and Nadia are here and can tell you more about all of that. The step after that that's much more exciting, even still and interesting, now is think about the Lego bricks. But now Lego bricks 
in a range of scales. So in the smallest scale, rather than just DNA or origami, what we're doing is iterative assembly of nanostructures and proteins so that you can grow nanostructures. Uh, one size bigger, this is micro Lego made out of electronic materials. Let's see. Yeah. So what you're looking at now is 3D assembly of uh, uh, circuitry of electronics. And, uh, my student, Will Langford, is reproducing the whole history of integrated electronics with six part types, n-type, p-type, semiconducting, insulated, resistive. And with just those six part types, by where you put them in 3D, you can make traces, vias, inductors, capacitors, resistors, transistors, and assemble integrated electronics in a reversible tabletop process. A bigger uh, scale steel, uh, my student, Kenny Chung, now at NASA last year, um, showed reversibly linking carbon fiber loops by an order of magnitude makes the highest modulus ultralight material. And so what he's doing is he's now at NASA Ames uh, designing shape-changing airplanes made by reversibly linking loops of carbon fiber, where then the whole uh, structure itself is deformable. And then on bigger length scales still, uh, my student Matt Carney this afternoon will be showing work on this sort of robot. Today when you make a A350 or a 787, there's an autoclave the size of the airframe to wind fibers the size of the airframe. What we showed is reversibly linking little carbon fiber loops is actually lighter and stronger. And then instead of having one big part, you can mass produce lots of little parts. And then this robot, it's a funny sort of robot. It's sort of like a ribosome, the protein that makes proteins, in that all it can do is go one step forward or backwards and add or remove one part. But by iterating them, we're now working with air Airbus to make airplane printers that eliminates the whole supply chain, the whole $20 billion supply chain that makes final assembly make the whole airplane. It's not printing an airplane, but assembling an airplane. And in fact, on the biggest scale, um, uh, this is some modeling we're doing for a project with Homeland Security on geoprinting, on making landscape. And what that's about is um, Superstorm Sandy or Katrina can do $20 billion damage, and our national technical means is bags of wet sand. Um, and so we're looking at reversibly making landscape on demand for disaster response. And so across this range, it's very hard to print electronics. We're, we're cheating. We're not printing. We're assembling electronics out of high-performance materials. It's very hard to print carbon fiber little parts. Again, we're cheating. We're linking loops of carbon fiber to assemble it. It's very, very hard to print mountains. Again, we're kind of cheating. And so from molecules up to mountains, the insight is we're finding by discreetly assembling reversibly joined materials, you can get into these wild regimes you can't get to with any other kind of fabrication process because the information is in the materials, not in the computer. Then finally, um, this is the mathematics of folding. Uh, this is designing how you go from a 1D code to a 3D shape, the opposite of protein folding. Work with uh, Eric Demain and Saul Griffith and Kenny Chung and Jonathan Backrock. And then my student, Ara Kanayan, who's the Ara in Project Ara as trivia, um, uh, has developed really interesting electropermanent motor actuators. This is a segment to make uh, programmable matter systems. And so finally, this is developing structures where there is no machine, where the material itself is shape changing. And what that all adds up to is this picture. There are mainframe computers, then mini computers, then hobbyist computers, then PCs. We're now recreating that. MIT's 1952 mill is like the, the mainframe of fabrication. The fab labs I'll talk about are like the mini computers. The machines that make machines I showed and James and Nadia are showing are like the hobbyist machines. And then the end result is the Star Trek replicator. The Star Trek replicator isn't a 3D printer. That's a piece of plastic or maybe metal. The Star Trek replicator is coding the construction of functional materials from microscales on up, and that's where the research is heading. There's two lessons from this parallel. The first lesson is the internet wasn't invented after the iPhone. The internet was invented in the mini computer era. That's one of my favorite pictures. It's Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie inventing Unix, which all modern computing, all good modern computing came from. Um, <laughs> um, and what made that possible, it was a work group could use it, not a whole corporation. Um, 
And so this was an accident. The National Science Foundation at one point came to me and said, you got a lot of taxpayer money, show social impact. And they did it because Congress told them to do it. They didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to do it. But we thought the machines were fun. So we set up a community version of the most used machines on campus, about 100K investment. And then they've been doubling about every year and a half for about 10 years. So there's hundreds of these labs around the world, as far north as you can go in Norway or as far south in Africa. Um, the one I'm showing you there is in Vestmanair. Um, if you've seen the pictures of a volcanic island in Iceland where the city is being destroyed by the volcano, that's where this is. <laughs> the, the volcano came through, they cleaned up. And it's a wonderful fab lab, 100K investment, um, uh, 3D design, additive fabrication, much more used as sub precision subtractive fabrication, small scale up to large format, and then embedded programming, all of that. So this is enough technology, not just to make technology, but to make machines. So boats, bicycles, kayaks, houses, internet terminals, healthcare, consumer electronics, production tooling, all of that are projects in Fab Labs. Once you kind of have this scale of technology, you can create almost anything, including all of that. Um, we started spreading those, and the biggest surprise for me, in turn, has been the impact. Um, uh, in Barcelona, fabulous design sense, things, you know, if you look at the Sagrada Familia, and 50% youth unemployment. It's an amazing number. A whole generation doesn't get to leave home and get a job. Um, my friend Vicente Gaillard, who started the first Fab Lab in Barcelona, is now the city architect. He's the planner. Um, his buddy, Tony, uh, who started, co-started the Fab Lab, is the deputy mayor, and they got their buddy to be the mayor. So rather than complaining, they just took over the city. <laughs> and what they're doing is really interesting. Um, they're filling the city with fab labs as urban planning. And the reason is 50% unemployment, but they buy products made far away and trash goes to landfill. So they want the city to be globally connected for knowledge, but self-sufficient locally so the city can produce what it consumes. If you think about a job in a factory, you uh, go somewhere remote from where you live to do something you don't want to do, making something designed by somebody you don't know for somebody you'll never see to get money to get something that you want. That, that's kind of the, the deal we make in our economy. If anybody can make anything, this connection between you know, consumption becomes creation, you can produce rather than consume things made far away. And so Barcelona's turned into this grand experiment for fabrication, and they're also doing it for energy and for food, to be globally connected for knowledge, um, but self-sufficient locally to produce what you consume. Uh, and if you're interested, once a year all these labs meet, and the city is hosting it this summer um, with an event looking at, at really kind of a return to the city-state, self-sufficient cities. In a funny way, Barcelona has left Spain and Europe. It's not Catalan separatism, it's just neither Spain nor Europe can't, can help much. Um, when you spend time with CEOs and executives and political leaders, it's very depressing because their levers don't work. <laughs> When you spend time in these settings, it's really exciting. And in turn, there's a real divergence in the economy. Um, this is President Obama visiting one of these fab labs in Ohio. Um, Bill Foster is the last remaining physicist in Congress, because Rush Holt retired and Vern, reti Vern Ellers retired. And he wrote a really interesting bill in the House, and um, Durbin and Gillibrand introduced it in the Senate, proposing to take this um, network of uh, fab labs in the US and charter it as being in the national interest, not spend new money on it, but recognizing it as a new notion of a national lab that's not a billion dollar thing far away from where people are, but as a connected local lab, um, chartering it as a public-private partnership. And uh, Chevron, in fact, made one of the first commitments to this, a $10 million commitment to set up these tools in the community it works as an investment in infrastructure. You, know, you expect a civilized society to have a library and a sewer system. This is viewing the means to make as infrastructure. You could start a business, um, you could do research, but, it's, but it, it, you don't really ask what is the business model of your library. It's part of literacy in a society. This is now a literacy of turning data to things and things to data. And so in turn, um, the Internet was invented on PDPs, as was video games, word processing, just about everything you do on a computer. Um, PDPs spun off. MIT made the first transistorized computers, the TX series, and that got commercialized as the PDP. It begat this great cluster on Route 1 in 
28 of Wang Prime Data General deck. Um, every one of them failed. The, the organizational lesson is they were all doomed. It didn't matter how good you were at organizational change, they were just doomed. And Ken Olson famously said, the head of DEC, nobody needs a computer in the home. Um, uh, little out of context, but that's what he said. And the point is, you don't have a computer in the home to do inventory and payroll. You have a computer in the home to do what you do. Um, I don't need to belabor that here, but the idea of personal fabrication isn't to make what you can buy at Walmart, but it's to make what you can't buy at Walmart. It's, 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 you can mass produce things where everybody wants the same thing. It's to make things where people want uh, different things. Every one of these companies looked at PCs and said, that's a toy, it doesn't scale. Um, they all failed. But the lesson, of course, is scaling only makes sense if everybody needs the same thing. <laughs> um, mainframe survived, but with a much more specialized role, and of course, we still have PCs. And so, coming forward to the present, and even at this meeting, manufacturing is a kind of deadly term. When you say manufacturing, it, it's sort of the picture on the left. You know, it's meant to be kind of serious and kind of um, boring and it's something you do. What we're seeing is in this ferment of the fab labs and hacker spaces and tech shops and maker fairs and all of that, they're creating a huge amount of economic activity that's not visible to the executive suites worrying about and the government leaders worrying about the future of manufacturing. But the lesson to draw from history is the jobs aren't coming back to, yeah, to on your left. Um, the Great Recession and the jobless recovery, something's going wrong, the jobs aren't coming back. And the conclusion, retracing the history of the digital revolution in computing and communication, is we're doing a new one now in fabrication. It's, it's creating new jobs, but they don't go to the places on the left. The things on the right aren't toys. They don't scale in the sense that if everybody needs the same part, you don't use that. And so they don't replace mass manufacturing, but it creates all these new econ economic layers uh, that didn't exist before. Um, it's a very precise parallel, and I believe in history. So today, the technology to make stuff is like the PDP. When you got to the PC, remember, the PC put in one box, processing, storage, graphics, I.O., each of those was a separate rack in the room full of uh, PDP. Today, you need a room of all of those machines to make machines, the 20-year research roadmap is to put them into one box. That's a lot of work to come, but it's progressing well. Um, but the hist one historical lesson is you don't need to wait 20 years to invent the internet. What's happening today is if anybody can make anything, how do you live, work, and play? And we found the harder and more interesting question is the social engineering. It really breaks the boundaries of how we organize society. Um, uh, and in turn, it, uh, it leads to this research roadmap to the Star Trek replicator and the recognition that toys aren't toys. The toys really are the future of the economy. So with that background here, and I'll thank you.